Okay, so hi everybody, thank you so much for joining today uh, for this PowerShape of Flex introductory webinar. Um, so my name's Claire, I'm a project manager here at Carbon Co-op, um, and then my colleague Alex is also on the call as well. Uh, so Alex is sharing the slides today. Um, so first of all, we'll just have a look at the agenda for today. So we've got an hour for our webinar. Um, so we will be first talking about uh, what is PowerShape and Flex? So we'll have a look at um, the, the service itself. Then we'll be hearing from Ian, who's kindly going to give us some real life experience of, of PowerShape and Flex, um, participating in demand side response events, and also putting into context what grid flexibility means um, and the wider connotations of flexibility. Um, then we'll be having a look at how PowerShape and Flex works. Um, then we'll be doing a little mini survey, so just to hear what you think, um, but don't worry, we'll be testing the survey tool uh, in a few minutes as well, um, and then we'll have a look at the timeline for the trial and what will happen next. So feel free to put any questions in the chat, but we won't be monitoring those as we go along. We'll be saving those questions for the end. Um, so feel free to put them in the chat or just raise any questions during that Q&A at the end. Uh, so we've just got an hour for today. Uh, so we'll get started. Uh, so what is PowerShape Flex uh, and why do we need it? So our electricity system and use of electricity is rapidly transforming. Um, so as we uh, start to see more renewable generation from uh, wind sources and solar go into the grid, um, while that's really positive, what that can mean, that can be a less constant source uh, versus fossil fuels. Um, we're also seeing electricity demand increase as people move to EV chargers, to electric vehicles, to electric um, heating, whether that's heat pumps or immersion or uh, domestic battery storage. So whilst that supply is changing, so is the demand. So what does that mean for our electricity grid? So that means uh, that the electricity grid has to change to manage this change in supply and demand. So demand side response is a term that you may or may not be familiar with. Um, so this is uh, just a quote that's been taken from the National Grid web website, which gives a, quite a nice overview of what demand side response is. So it helps soften peaks in demand and fill in the troughs, especially at times when power is more abundant, affordable and clean. So we can see this graph on the right hand side here from uh, researchgate.net. So what demand side response is, is it means that network operators such as Electricity Northwest um, can take a look at the week ahead. They can say, OK, it's going to be a less windy day next week, or there might be an event, which means that will be a big surge of demand for electricity at a certain time. Uh, and that means that the way that electricity is used can respond to that supply. So that demand for electricity can either um, shave those peaks where there's going to be high demand, large controllable loads can be turned off, or if there is a surplus supply, uh, large controllable loads can then be turned on to use that surplus. So, um, this is where we're just going to practice very quickly um, looking at what you think. So this is a tool called Slido and we'll be using this a bit later, um, but you can join this small survey two ways. So if you've got a phone with a camera, um, what you can do is you can either point your camera at the QR code on the screen here and it will tell you, uh, you'll be able to then follow that link to the Slido. Alternatively, Alex will put in the chat um, this link. So you can follow that link to this small um, survey as well. So the question is, before, power, before hearing about PowerShape or Flex, were you aware of demand side response? So have you been familiar with demand side response before, um, before hearing about PowerShape or Flex? So I'll just give it a couple of minutes for you to link to that survey. And uh, I think what I'll do as well, uh, are we able to just put that, um, that link in the chat as well? I don't see any active poll at the moment. Is, uh, has it been launched yet? 
Yeah. yeah, there's no poll yet, Claire. Just gonna just gonna stop sharing and clarify because uh, I can't mute unmute myself when I'm sharing. Uh, so the poll will launch; it will go live when we go to the next slide. So we've just got to stay on that slide whilst everyone joins it. Um, and I'll just get you the Slido link. So that should be in the chat now as well. I just shared that as well. So you can follow that link and click on it. Brilliant. So now if we go to the next slide, that should begin. So yeah, the question just to clarify, so before hearing about PowerShell Flex, I'm just interested to know um, if you were aware of demand side response. So all the answers here are anonymous. So if you click on one of the options, we won't see who's clicked on it. We'll just say, we'll just see those results. Okay, fabulous, that's brilliant. So that's great. Thank you so much for completing that. Uh, so that's a little bit of an introduction to Slido as well. Um, and we can see that we've got a few people there who have heard a bit about it. Um, uh, so no one's never heard of it before. Okay, that's good to know, so thank you. Um, so if we just go on to the next slide then. So demand side response is something that does exist particularly in big industry at the moment. So uh, it might be that a network operator will ask a factory or industry to turn down or turn up their usage at certain points, because obviously that is a big drain on the electricity grid. However, what we're seeing now is that demand side response is becoming more prevalent on a domestic scale. And this is where PowerShape Reflex really comes in. Um, so just on that next slide, we can see that there are, um, coming into more mainstream um, language, we can think about how to switch off, switch on, and really change our electricity use to help with this transition to more renewable sources uh, in the electricity grid, and to really support the good, op the good operation of, of the electricity network. So just to summarise that, so PowerShape Reflex and the Home Energy Management System, so what is it? Um, so PowerShape Reflex is a service which gives users better visibility of energy consumption and production. So if, like me, you've got solar PV but no controllable load, you can connect your solar PV to the system uh, and we'll see a bit later how you can then view your solar production predicted for the next hour, for the next day. Um, and that can really inform how and when you use energy in your house. So that's kind of a manual intervention. But secondly, it's also a service which can support the flexible opera operation of the electricity grid. So responding to these network operator requests um, using automated control of these controllable loads in domestic settings. So this is a really, really key part of the system is that whereas, um, yes, it is possible to have manual interventions, but with PowerShape Flex, if you have a large controllable load in your house, such as an EV or an immersion heater or, or a battery store, we can use the system to automate that uh, response. Um, so you don't even necessarily need to be at home um, and it can happen in the middle of the night um, and that's all pre-programmed. So the aim here is to empower individuals to be part of these flexibility provider communities and contribute to the good operation of the grid. So the word community here is really important because you might be thinking, well, if I switch my EV charger off at a certain time, is that going to make a huge difference? Well, maybe not individually, but, uh, and if we look on the next slide, please, Alex. Um, this is really the future of this more agile electricity grid. So this is a map which has been taken from Electricity Northwest's website. So what net network operators um, are doing currently and for the next 10 years, they're mapping out where these very localized um, sources of flexibility are needed. 
So what we're going to see over the course of the next year, uh, next 10 years, is um, these localised communities of flexibility providers. It might be on a district level or it can even be a street connected to a particular substation who are able to participate in these switch off, switch on events. And there will be um, financial um, uh, compensations for doing this. So as you as you'll be aware, as part of this trial, we are doing simulations of these real life network operator requests. Um, and we are also simulating the fact that you will be financially compensated for turning off, turning on your device at a certain time. Um, but rather than per event, you'll be receiving a bulk a voucher for your participation and then we'll look at the different phases of those vouchers as well um, at the end of the webinar and then just one more part of this community idea of Cloudshape of Flex um, is that this uh, next phase of testing is not just in the UK so this is part of a wider demonstrator trial uh, where other pilot sites across Europe are also using the home energy management system to test grid flexibility in, in their uh, respective countries in different use cases. So obviously we're here in the UK, but these um, are also being tested in Belgium, Germany, France and Spain. So there is a real community around how how can we use electricity more flexibly? Um, just to note as well, the name of the home energy management system as part of this trial, uh, as part of the wider trial, is the coffee box. That uh, these, these names are used interchangeably. So the coffee box is the home energy management system. So you might see that name around a bit. Um, okay, so we're going to hand over to Ian now, who's just going to tell us a bit about uh, experience of PowerShape Reflex. So Ian has participated in previous uh, demand side response testing events with PowerShape Reflex, and also uh, how that that is put in a wider context of grid flexibility. So over to you, Ian. I sort of, I don't know if you want to move on to the next slide, Claire, while I do a bit of an introduction. Um, so yeah, I, I'm Ian Madeley. I have been working, so I work in, in universities for the last sort of uh, 12 or 13 years in um, energy systems management, essentially, and how the renewable systems are going to impact on those. Um, although I retired um, in March of this year, um, and I've participated in the previous um, PowerShape Reflex event uh, because I have an EV um, which is connected to the system. Um, so I thought it would just be a little, you know, just to sort of build on what uh, Claire was already saying, um, I'll let, just give you a little bit of back, deeper background into, into why we need to do these sorts of things. This is a graph as a, a former colleague of mine, Grant Wilson, who, who regularly tracks these things, but he looks at the UK's energy demand in terms of how much electricity we use, how much um, essentially petroleum, you know, gas and diesel, uh, petrol and diesel we use, um, and, and how much gas we use for, for home heating. So the red line is um, electricity. The sort of grey lumpy bit in the middle is uh, transport, petrol and diesel. And the blue line up and down like a yo yo is the the heating for our homes and of course one of the things that we're going to see in addition to all the other things that claire's been talking about is a move away from gas as a heating source for our homes into potentially electricity as a heating source for a home and you can see that the amount of energy um, that's being used to heat our homes particularly in the winter is much much larger than the amount of energy that is used in the electrical system. So we just want to roll forward one slide, please. Um, so this is just a quick screenshot of the, um, the National Grid Control Center feed. Um, and the important dial here is the big one at the top second from the left, which is the frequency. Um, so we have an alternating current electricity system in this country, which is run nominally at 50, cycle, 50 hertz, 50 cycles a second. 
Um, and as the demand on the system goes up, it's a bit like when you drive your car up, it's up a hill. If you don't give it more energy by um, you know, pushing down on the accelerator, then it slows down. And, and what would happen is that the frequency would drop. And similarly, if you're going downhill, you have to lift off a bit, to stay within the speed limit. And so there are people who are paid to keep that um, within 0.5 of a hertz of uh, 50 hertz. And, and that's what we talk, we mean when we talk about making calls for demand side response. It's how do we adjust quickly to be able to keep that at 50 hertz? So just move on one for me. Um, and that then reflects in, in the price. Um, and this is this is public, it's it's published by Drax, it comes out every day. Um, and I can't read the date on it. I think it's a couple of days. I took the screenshot a couple of days ago, but you can see at, in the middle of the night. The price uh, of electricity from power stations were, was 115 pounds a megawatt hour. Um, obviously, you pay for your electricity in kilowatt hours, and, there, and there's other costs on top. But that's effectively um, 11 and a half pence a kilowatt hour coming off the power stations. And at the peak, it was uh, 382 pounds, so that's 38 pence. Um, a kilowatt hour coming off the power stations and yet that's why you get people talk about half hourly billing um, which will come in as as we go forward again um, i had hoped to be able to do this live i've just got on my other screen here um, so i've gone back to the 5th of july 2020 um, and the middle of the night the low price was minus 59 pounds 76 so you would have been paid five pence to use a kilowatt hour of electricity um, that's when i like to charge my ev <laughs> um, and if you won't roll on one more um, and it can get very very volatile so uh we had an incident again this is back in 2020 um when, when we lost one of the interconnectors to europe and you can see that the the price spike there took us up to 2,200 pounds per megawatt hour. That's 22 pounds for a kilowatt hour of electricity. Uh, I don't want to be paying that and neither do you. I think that's probably the end of my slide, isn't it, Claire? Yeah. Um, so I, I have the car plugged in, usually overnight. Um, I use Octopus Go, so the cheap rate for Octopus Go is from half past midnight to half past four. Um, so I have my home energy management system basically to turn the charger on um, at that time to routinely charge the car. Obviously, the power shape reflex can then charge it or can't discharge it at the moment because I don't have a, a, a vehicle to grid um, uh, system but that, that will come, I'm sure. Um, the only other thing I would say, um, and it, I'm probably a bit radical in this, uh, in my thinking, but we're currently talking about large loads like EVs and, and immersion heaters and things like that. The real, the real benefit for these systems will when, when they get into mass um, utilities. And, and my favorite is fridges and freezers. Nobody cares when the compressor on the freezer runs. They just want the ice cream to stay cold. Back to you, Claire. Thank you so much for that, Ian. That really helps to kind of uh, make it tangible. Um, and it's incredible to see the fluctuations and how difficult it is to manage this, this supply and demand um, so that it's constant and we don't experience power outages. and, and, and crazy prices. Melted ice cream is the important one. There's actually been some research done. Ice cream is the indicator product in your freezer as to whether or not it works. <laughs> ice cream is the indicator product. Maybe we'll get some free samples for testing. Thanks so much, Ian. That's great. Um, so 
that puts into context what power shape of flex is and and why it's why we're doing this really um so in this next section we're just going to look at how power shape of flex works and what devices we can use with it at the moment so your at some point, you may have uh, completed um, the Power Shape of Flex enrollment form. And you've told us that either you have solar PV, maybe a diverter as well, um, or you might have controllable loads, such as an immersion heater, uh, an EV with potentially an EV charger, or maybe not yet. Um, and maybe you've got a battery store. So during this enrolment process, um, our team, our technical team, have analysed what devices um, you have, um, what kind of setup you've got, um, and it also is important about the model as well. So not all models of EV charger, for example, can work with PowerShape of Flex. Um, so some models of EV charger are quite locked down, so they're not interoperable. And um, so the key thing here is that data can be can be um, shared, and there is a, a connection available with these smart devices. So. Um, if you've managed to um, uh, complete the form and then we've analysed it and we've said, OK, so we can work with your device, brilliant. The next step is that uh, in some cases there might need to be a, a piece of kit installed. So an electrician might uh, need to visit. So you might be at a different stage of this. They might have already visited and set up this piece of equipment. Maybe this has been scheduled in. Maybe it hasn't happened yet. Um, but uh, so here we've got a picture of an EV charger. So again, some EV chargers we can't work with. So we might need to install an interoperable model that we can uh, connect with. Uh, if you have an immersion heater, uh, there'll be a, a relay switch installed. So this just adds a sort of extra layer of smartness to your device. And it allows for that, uh, that data feed, that information to be sent to the home energy management system. So that's the first step. So that might be an electrician visit. Uh, <laughs> uh, the second step will be for Carbon Co-op to come and visit your house. So um, this will be uh, when the, the HEMS box itself is installed. So this is the home energy management system or the coffee box. So it's about the size of a large matchbox or um, um, an external hard drive, something like that. And it's then connected into your um, Wi-Fi router. So that's just using the cable here. So um, then at this stage as well. So on the next slide, we can also see that you'll also get access to PowerShape Monitor as being part of PowerShape Reflex. So you can connect your smart meter at any stage. So this can be before the electrician has visited, it can be afterwards, um, but uh, you'll get free access to PowerShape and Monitor. And what PowerShape and Monitor is, is an extra uh, dashboard. So you have good visibility of your uh, electricity usage, daily and your CO2 emissions and a really key part of connecting your smart meter uh, with the system is that this is how we create baseline data. So once you've um, participated in a PowerShape Reflex uh, demand side response event, we can then show how, how much flexibility has been provided. So what that means here we can see a uh, seven o'clock on an evening, I use quite a lot of electricity. Um, but if I had an EV and that was switched off at a certain time for half an hour or an hour, then we'd get a, 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 an amount of flexibility that had been supplied. So once all of these um, are connected, so we can see here that the HEMS is sits at the heart of uh, making your smart devices talk to each other. So for solar PV, that's a downstream data stream, um, but with your controllable loads such as immersion heaters, EV and battery, uh, that's data coming into the system, but also these commands which can be sent from that home energy management system for these switch on, switch off events in response to uh, network operator requests. So Sorry if this is a bit small on the screen, but this is an example of 
the, uh, a dashboard that you then get um, once these are connected to the HEMS. Now we use a, a tool called Home Assistant, so this is an open source, um, really incredible tool, um, and it's been adapted for use with the HEMS. And this particular user has got their solar PV connected. So it's possible to then see uh, upcoming estimated solar production for the next hour, for the next day. So this can really inform your electricity use in the home. You can also see EV, EV charge control um, and you get various other graphs as well. Uh, and what's really nice about Home Assistant is it shows that any energy distribution uh, for non-fossil fuels, so you can actually see in real time, uh, uh, sorry, on, on that graph, um, how much you have used from renewable sources each day. So as part of the installation, you'll get that, you'll get access to that dashboard. Um, and there is actually a, a webinar tomorrow evening, which goes into some really detailed use cases of Home Assistant as part of an Eco Home Lab tomorrow evening. So what actually happens in a demand side response event? So as, as we mentioned, we are simulating real life distribution network operator requests. So we're going to create a schedule of these requests. So once your home energy management system is connected, uh, we're, we're talking about here for demand side response events, immersion heaters, EVs and battery store. So a week prior to the event, you will receive a message either by text or email, depending on your, on your preferences, which will tell you that a power shaper turn down or turn up event will be taking place on a particular date. And it will tell you the exact time when that event will begin and end. It will tell you what device it will be switched off. So if you've got an EV connected, um, and then it will also send you a link, uh, which will go to this dashboard, which is the PowerShaper Flex dashboard. So from here, if you decide actually next week on Wednesday, I need to charge my car at that particular time, then you can always skip these events. So you're always able to opt out of events um, um, when, when they happen. So you'll always be informed of an event in advance and you can always opt out of a, a DSR event if it's not convenient for you to participate. So then what happens is, say for example, at 10 o'clock at night, the event is running, um, the signal will be sent through the HEMS and your EV charger, for example, or your immersion heater will switch off or switch on depending on what kind of event it is, whether it's a valley filling or a peak shaving event. Um, so again, you don't need to be at home. If you want to participate in that event, you don't have to do anything. It's only you, you opt out or skip the event if, if you don't want to participate. So you don't have to be at home. It's all automated and remote controlled. And then after the event, this is an example of uh, a graph that you will then get on the dashboard, which tells you the amount of flexibility that has been provided by participating in that event. So this is where that smart meter data comes into play. Now, not everybody has a smart meter or can connect to smart meters, so we can use other sources for this data. But the red line here shows that baseline information. So at eight o'clock on a Wednesday, I normally use this amount of electricity. But after participating in the demand side response event, I use this amount of electricity. And then this will all be fed into our analysis. Um, and then we can see how much the whole um, community of flexibility providers have contributed in, in a particular event. So we can also see here that on this graph, you're able to see your flexibility, but you can also see the combined flexibility as well. Now this is anonymized data, so you don't know who or where it's come from, but it shows that the, uh, as part of this community of PowerShaper Flex users, you have contributed this amount of flexibility to the grid. So that's basically what happens in a demand side response event. Uh, there, um, 
So what we want to do next is just try out that Slido again. Um, and we've got just two more small surveys that we're just really interested to know your thoughts of. So it's the same link as you used last time. So we can paste the link again. That's there again. And there should be a new, um, new survey here. So the question is, how did you find out about PowerShape Flex? So we'll just give it a couple of minutes for you to vote on that. Once you've voted, you can click um, submit, I think it is on Slido, and that will send your response in. Okay, we've got some others in there. If you if you didn't if you did say other, it'd be quite interesting to know where you, where you heard about it. Um, so feel free to comment in the chat if if you if you wanted to, or you can send that to me privately. Okay, brilliant. So mostly carbon co-op forum. Uh, email from carbon co-op. Great. Okay, perfect. Brilliant. Okay, thank you so much for voting in that. Um, and I think we've just got one final um, survey to vote on. And so this is another really key question. So what was your incentive to take part in PowerShape Reflex? What, what kind of is the most important thing for you? Um, Hey. That's great. I think everybody's potentially voted. So to create a cooperative smart grid has come out on top there. That's really interesting. Thank you. And to do my bit for the planet. Save money on energy bills. Find out more about grid flexibility as the top results. Thank you so much for voting on those. Okay, so um, final part of this webinar, we're just gonna talk about the next steps for this trial of PowerShape Reflex. Um, so we're looking at when things will happen and then we've got some time at the end for a bit of a Q&A session uh, where you can ask us questions about the trial, anything you want to know. Um, so what's happening now is um, we're currently growing the PowerShape of Flex community. So this will be, um, everybody might be at slightly different stages of their installations and their setup. So we've gone through the enrollment process and we've identified which um, uh, devices we can work with but we're also learning a lot as well during this process about which uh, new devices we can work with so in the previous trial we um, tended to um, switch out EV chargers a lot for an interoperable model but in more modern chargers we are finding that we can um, we can integrate with them um, a bit easier again not all models so uh, we are actually learning a lot as we go and if you've been involved in testing thank you so much because it's such an important part of, of the process so thank you for your help uh, as we test but uh, we're working with our electrical contractor um, over renewables and they are currently working on installations of the relay switches potentially new ev charges um, and different pieces of kits and we're also installing hems at the moment so that's happening now uh, and that will go through the autumn until around september um, and then the next phase is for the demand side response event testing to begin so that will begin in october so um this is when we will create this uh, schedule of um, upcoming events. And there'll be around 20 demand side response events in total. So there'll be roughly three a month, something like that. And it'll run until the spring the following year. Um, so 
there'll be three or four months. And again, you can always opt out of these demand side response events. Um, and so, yeah, that we'll be testing at different times of the day. Uh, we, we will be testing predominantly with turn off events, uh, but we will also be testing with some turn off, turn on events. Um, and it might be that your particular device can only do one or the other. Uh, the majority of devices can participate in both turn off and turn on events, but it might be that you are uh, only participating in turn off versus turn on events, um, which will let you know uh, about, of course, in advance. Um, so that's October till spring, the events will begin. Um, so this is when you'll receive your, your vouchers. So in total, you'll, you'll be receiving £300 in, in vouchers for your participation in this, in this testing phase. Um, so that's first of all, just to say thank you so much for, um, for being part of this movement uh, towards a more flexible grid. Um, and it, again, it is to simulate the fact that there will be financial um, compensations for participating in, in, um, in DSR in the future. So the first voucher is £50 voucher and that will be paid after your kit has been installed um, and there's, a, there's a, an initial survey where we're asking how did it go, you know, were there any issues with the installation and we'll also be asking a few questions about your energy usage uh, once your kit has been installed. So uh, you'll receive £50 in, in vouchers. Then voucher two will be £150, that will be after the uh, DSR event testing. And then you'll receive a third voucher at the end of the project, which will be next year around autumn. So that'll be £300 total. Uh, so just to go over that timeline. So now until September, there'll be installs. Um, DSR events will run October till spring, but it's worth noting as well that we will be running webinars and um, training sessions during that time, uh, just to hear about your experience of the DSR events. Then in uh, the spring to autumn, uh, we'll be analysing the results, so what happened, uh, and at this point we might ask for uh, your thoughts, um, maybe some user focus groups, some feedback sessions, some knowledge share, um, so that will be spring to autumn 2023, and then the trial will end but the service will continue. So this is where we're planning for PowerShaper Flex to become a service in its own right. So um, this is where we can start to really build these localized communities of PowerShaper, of PowerShaper Flex users and flexibility providers. Um, so that are, that, those are the plans for um, the next year for the trial and for the future of um, PowerShaper Flex. And uh, so finally, um, just before we go into Q&A, um, just to say that thanks to you that um, domestic demand side response is here to help reduce reliance on fossil fuels and to support the good operation of the, uh, the electricity network and the grid. Um, to increase the uptake of renewable technologies and really to help with the interoperability of these devices um, because open source and interoperability means that it's a more inclusive service going forward um, and then this is also to aid the green energy transition um, and then just on the next slide is just a few um, ways that you can get in touch so the best way is always to email powershaper at carbon.coop. Um, so if you've got any questions, any problems, just let us know, drop us an email. Um, and then you can also put any comments on the forum. So you might be familiar with the Carbon Co-op forum, um, but we'll post this link in the chat as well. Um, so this is where all Carbon Co-op members are able to talk about your experience if you've got a particular setup that you want to tell people about if you want to discuss any any parts of the trial or the project you can have a chat with other people that are uh, either involved in this trial or the trials or have had an experience of a retrofit potentially so um, you can talk about your experience on the forum there and you can always phone the carbon co-op office and as we mentioned during the trial of the webinars, these groups knowledge share and we'll be um, sending out some surveys at various points as well. Okay, so 
um, that's the end of this presentation. So now we've just got a, a bit of a Q&A session. So I can see there are a few comments uh, in, in the chat. Um, so, yep, yeah, there's one here. So what are the vouchers uh, exchanged for? So we've been using uh, a few different version, a few different voucher options, but uh, we tend to use Love to Shop. So you can then exchange those for uh, various different um, retailers um, online. Um, and then there's also a comment there: uh, rely on nuclear power. Did you want to? <laughs> you want to on that a bit? Do you want me to pick that one up, Claire? Sure. <laughs> Um, I personally, I, I don't think we will rely on nuclear power. Um, it's incredibly expensive to build. Nobody's successfully built a nuclear power station and operated it commercially yet, more or less anywhere in the world. And the French do a, a sort of reasonable job at it, but they, they you know, they, it's, it's an old technology. Um, the issue will be filling in those long periods in the winter when there is no wind and of course we don't have solar at this part of the world in the middle of winter because most of the time it's dark or cloudy if you live in manchester um so story energy storage is going to be the the main bugbear there i think there are some interesting potential solutions but it's it's really that long-term uh deep storage that will, that will come in i'm sure that we will get some nuclear built if only because the government seems to be fixated on it um i don't particularly want to live near one i don't suppose you want to live near one um and my concern would be what are you going to do with it when it's finished with the waste um, but they do have some advantages. We're not going to have that much, I wouldn't have thought, um, in the long term. The, it's how we get off the, the, the gas generation that's going to be the main issue. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that, Ian. Yeah, my, pers my, my personal favourite is hydrogen, but that's what I work on. <laughs> so... Um... There's just a comment here as well from from uh, Paul. So most of the information on my coffee box seems to be under air quality. Um, I don't know if Matt's online. Um, that might be some sensor data in there. Yeah, that seems strange, Paul. Um, yeah. Uh, so uh, so do you mean in terms of your uh, when you open your dashboard, you've got various different sensors, but they're all under that heading? That's right, yes. I've got energy distribution today, binary sensor, helpers, power shaper, switch, sensor, all under, and the weather, sunny, all under air quality, which seems odd. It does seem odd. It might be. Were you involved in the Eco Home Lab we did on energy, on uh, air quality data? Possibly. Because I think uh, a good thing to know about this is that you can um, edit those yeah. are all user editable basically so you can yeah. change change them and move them around as you as you wish and Brilliant. we'll perhaps do a um it might be good to do a sort of another introductory session which looks at how how you build dashboards and that and that kind of thing but um but yeah it it, it does seem strange i i i agree so i would uh, i would change it okay. yeah and, and, do, and do follow us up uh on email about that if you uh, if you aren't able to make all these changes because we can obviously it's a specific individual case but we'd be happy to sort of take a look and how about okay thanks matt thanks both matt okay um are there any other questions um about the uh, about power shape reflex or the trial or anything that's been covered today I would just repeat whether it's possible to have, uh, as Peter Bates has asked, whether we could have the day of the week on the Power Shaper Flex uh, view, as well as the date. It's been an outstanding request for some time, but it shouldn't be a difficult thing to put on, I would have thought. So 
So just for people that may not be familiar with the system, um, this is referring to that Home Assistant dashboard that we had a, had a bit of a look at before. Um, so there are lots and lots of possibilities with this user dashboard um, uh, for customizations and for visibility of different energy consumption usage and production. I was thinking more about the PowerShape of Flex dashboard. That's a different one, isn't it? Sure. Ah, sorry. Yes, you're absolutely right. So, um, PowerShape of Flex is the uh, dashboard that we were looking at as well, which is for where you can opt out of those uh, Flex events. Um, so, yeah, I think one thing we are quite interested in is how to kind of unify these dashboards a bit more and um, create kind of a, a easier ways to, to um, log into them or access them from one source. Yes, that'd be good. It's just the um, that view data screen doesn't, it shows the date, but not the day of the week. It's something Peter Bates requested months ago and we're still hoping, I think he and I, on the smart, on the smart meter data. Okay, on the smart meter, cool. Yeah, um, I mean, yeah, thanks. Uh, I think we've uh, sort of recently sort of haven't had a lot of like resources to put into the sort of um, improving the smart meter something, but it is something we are sort of conscious of. And I think hopefully, as uh, sort of we're using that data in, in this project and other sort of projects going forward, we'll hopefully be able to make some sort of minor improvements on, on parts of it there as, uh, again going forward. Um, so, uh, yeah, definitely it's on our radar and uh, like uh, we hopefully sort of having a bit of a, uh, a lineup of things uh, to make some minor adjustments so uh, we haven't forgotten about it it's uh, just been quite hard at the moment ian you've got your hand up uh, yeah i was just going to respond to uh, uh i don't know how to pronounce the name Fioby spencer's question she's put a link into a bbc um Thing on um, sand batteries, so these are these are heat batteries essentially. They're ways of storing heat, um, usually fairly low grade heat. Um, they're not that useful in a domestic setting. There, that you usually you usually see these in a much bigger sort of if you're attached to, to a district heating system or something like that. Um, you know, your your hot water cylinder is is a heat battery in effect. Um, but you rot it cold pretty quickly if you try and heat your house with it. <laughs> oh, very in yeah, interesting. I've not seen those before. Thanks for sharing that, Phoebe. That's great. Very interesting. You can get um, one that relies on phase change if you want one for your house. So if you want to replace, if you don't want a hot water system that's on water, but you do want to be able to store heat. We have quite a lot of users. Yeah, we've got a lot of members, I think, or a few at least on the on the forum who sort of posted about this as well. So if you are interested in some sort of domestic heat batteries, then uh, that'd be the place to look because, uh, yeah, there, yeah, there are there's a lot of interest in them. I mean, there's a lot of pros and cons as well, but um, yeah, yeah, but, yeah. <laughs> Certainly, if you've got a PV on your roof and you and you want to store heat, it's it's a good way of doing it. Interesting. Okay. Great. Um, so, any more comments or questions? If not, I think we'll we'll wrap it up there. Um, so we can we'll be sharing the recording around. Um, so thank you so much for joining today, um, and I look forward to working together in the next phase. So thank you so much. Have a good day. Bye. Uh